Campbell Soup is going to label its GMOs, but is it too little too late? Welcome to the second episode of Good News Next Week. I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Good News Next Week, of course, being the spinoff from the long-running series New World Next Week between myself and my good buddy James Corbett, where we try and highlight some of the ways that we are winning. Our first story this week, Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus will no longer use elephants. After May 1st, they are ending the elephant show, and 18 months early... Feld Entertainment announced it would phase out elephants by 2018, but moved up their retirement to the occult Walpurgis Beltane holiday, a.k.a. May Day, May 1st, 2016. Here is the AP. Ringling Brothers' greatest show on earth will soon be saying farewell to their remaining 11 elephants, a year and a half earlier than expected. In May of this year, we'll be moving all of our elephants, including these ones behind me, from our touring units of Ringling Brothers, Barnum & Bailey, to live at our Center for Elephant Conservation permanently. I'm sorry, I don't have any food for you. Parent company Failed Entertainment announced last year it would be retiring the elephants mm -hmm. in 2018 because of growing public concern about how the animals are treated. New laws across the country also made it challenging to use elephants in certain cities and towns. It has become more difficult and will become more difficult in the future to tour elephants. And we just thought this would be in the best interest of the elephants to have consistency and have them at the place where they can, you know, live and thrive and, you know, of course, be a part of our incredible conservation program. The company's 200-acre conservation property in Central Florida, located between Orlando and Tampa, already houses dozens of elephants. With new structures in place faster than expected, the remaining 11 Asian elephants will call this place home by the spring, where the entertainers will transition into a new role. We've gotten involved in this groundbreaking pediatric cancer research that involves our elephants. So wait, 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 wait. They're ending the circus elephant show so they can send them to the cancer elephant show. Some have claimed that elephants don't get cancer because they don't eat meat, but we're not really going to get into that right here and right now. But I think this might be yet another example of too little too late. If you see a lot of the comments and things on these stories and on these tweets, they say people weren't really going to the circus, let alone SeaWorld and all these places. As I think really their, their, their time has turned and if you spend any time amount at home with your own loved kind of pet, these kind of situations, you know, aren't really good for animals. And that's putting it pretty lightly. So we'll see what happens after May 1st. But let's hear the rest from the Associated Press. Because cancer is much less common in elephants than in humans, scientists believe their blood may hold the key to a cure. They will be able to study the elephant's blood samples. The conservation center is a sham. But animal rights activists have said in the past they have concerns about the center as well. They take a charitable deduction for having it, but it's a profit-making enterprise at the elephant's expense. The elephants need to go to a proper sanctuary. They've got a long reach. For now, the 9,000-pound feature attraction will continue a tradition that goes back more than a century. Uh, so that relationship, I think, is the most uh, rewarding, uh, to share that relationship with uh, such uh, amazing creatures. But that relationship will be changing soon. The last shows for the elephants are May 1st in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and Providence, Rhode Island. Our second story this week is the good big news story. Campbell's Soup to voluntarily label all U.S. products for GMOs. And we'll take this via Reuters and Activist Post. Campbell's Soup Company said it will label all of its U.S. products for the presence of ingredients derived from genetically modified organisms, becoming the first major food company to respond to growing calls for more transparency about content in food. The world's largest soup maker broke with ranks, broke ranks rather with peers, and said it supported the enactment of federal legislation for a single mandatory labeling standard for GMO-derived foods and a national standard for non-GMO claims made on food packaging. The company, which also owns Pepperidge Farm cookies and Prego pasta sauces, said it would withdraw from all efforts by groups opposing such measures, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. Several activist groups have been pressuring food companies to be more transparent about the use of ingredients, especially GMO-derived ones, amid rising concerns about their effects on health and the environment. Several big companies, such as PepsiCo Incorporated, Kellogg Company, and Monsanto, have resisted such calls and have spent millions of dollars to defeat GMO labeling ballot measures in states such as Oregon. 
Colorado, Washington, and California, saying it would add unnecessary costs. Monsanto said in a statement Friday that it sells seeds to farmers and does not manufacture or sell food products from crops grown from those seeds. Now, this is an important sidebar, as this misinformation has been circulating for years, and I even saw it back at the Oregon-based grocery store that I worked for for several years. Important years as I saw the food revolution and the economic collapse happen, and I watched it happen from the sales floor. Monsanto's actually right on this point. They don't own those food companies, not in any sense that is sort of actionable. And you probably saw that on your socials throughout the last years, and I hope you didn't share it because it's moves like that that discredit everyone, which is not an accident. Continuing, the six biggest agrochemical and biotech seed companies, Monsanto, DuPont, Dow AgroSciences, Bayer Crop Science, BASF Plant Science, you know, the people you buy cassette tapes from, I definitely want to buy my food from them, and Syngenta spent more than $21.5 million to defeat a 2012 California proposition, that's 37, the labeling proposition, according to state election data. Another sidebar, guess who also spent money to derail that California labeling bill? Mmm, -mm. soup is good food. Campbell's Soup donated $589,000 to defeat Prop 37 and another $385,000 to defeat a similar initiative in Washington State in 2013. Another case of too little too late. I think if you're watching this, you probably know you shouldn't be getting your soup from a metal can by this point anyway. And hopefully, as we start to make Food World Order episodes here in the Media Monarchy Kingdom, we'll show you how easy it is to just make broth and make soup yourself. We're working on it right now. In a related story, Monsanto eliminating a thousand more jobs due to falling sales. Now, while we'll never take glee in another person losing their job in a country that is massively hemorrhaging jobs, this isn't probably the way to work. Again, from the Associated Press, Monsanto said on January 6th it will eliminate another 1,000 jobs as it expands a cost-cutting plan designed to deal with falling sales of biotech, corn seeds, and other financial headwinds. The additional layoffs will bring the agriculture giant's total planned cuts to 3,600 jobs over the next two years, or about 16% of its global workforce. In October 2015, the company first announced the restructuring plan intended to streamline its sales, research and development, and other operations. The St. Louis, Missouri company says the restructuring will cost about $1.1 or $1.2 billion to implement, and that's more than the 850 or 900 million estimates that were originally there. By the end of fiscal 2018, the company expects the changes to generate annual savings of $500 million. So Monsanto might not be going down the toilet in the next couple of days or months or even years. But if we don't buy the foods that are GMOs, those companies will stop putting them in their soups. And if those companies stop putting them in their soups, that means they're not going to be buying it for Monsanto and your effects ripple out. And again, as we say time and time, the revolution begins in your fridge and in your medicine cabinet. Our third and final story this week on Good News Next Week, UK Cafe feeds 10,000 people in 10 months with 20 tons of unwanted food. Another good one from Activist Post and a story we've been covering for many years on Media Monarchy, and that's the story of waste. Are you aware that in the United States nearly 40% of the food produced is tossed into the trash? As it makes its way to the landfill, 795 million people in the world wonder where their next meal's coming from. It's ridiculous as well as disheartening, which is why activists around the planet are doing their part to help reduce food waste and feed others with the discarded scraps. That's what Adam Smith, founder of the Real Junk Food Project, is doing in Armley, Leeds. The social entrepreneurs created an empire of social cafes through which to cook up stews, casseroles, soups, and cakes with the unwanted products from supermarkets, independent grocers, and food banks. The most unique aspect of this business model is that it has a pay-as-you-feel rule. This policy encourages patrons to pay what they feel they can pay. If that's nothing, then they can work for their meal. The UK Independent reports that in only 10 months, Smith helped to feed 10,000 people on 20 tons of unwanted food and in the process made for, no, what's, what's the number here? 30,000 UK pounds, which is translated into 43,000 United States Federal Reserve notes. 
Since its success, 47 other similar style cafes have popped up in Manchester, Bristol, Saltaire, Los Angeles, Brazil, Warsaw, and Zurich. In the United States, a similar grocery store called The Daily Table transforms unwanted or expired leftovers into tasty food for their customers. The founder of that endeavor is Doug Roch, former president of Trader Joe's, one of the biggest food wasters around in the supermarket world. It's difficult for entrepreneurs inspired to repurpose food to carry out their vision. As in many areas of the world, retailers can be prosecuted if they sell food after the use-by date. The best before date is allowed, which is why Smith's organization wants the law to be changed to prevent supermarkets from disposing of so much food at the fear of prosecution. We will include in the show notes, as everything we play and say will be included in the show notes. The tag waste on Media Monarchy goes back into the archives almost... uh, six plus years so this is a story we've been following for a long time in the media monarchy.com kingdom as we wrap up this episode of good news next week we just look at the headlines hashtag good news next week they are submitted by you as the way we get a lot of our stories on good news next week we we crowdsource it there were supposed to be 11 bankers arriving at westminster magistrates court on monday only six showed up Six banksters charged, five absent, as UK begins first Euribor rigging case. Those that did appear were formally charged with conspiring to manipulate the benchmark Euribor interest rate. Four Germans and a French citizen did not appear. Reuters correspondent Kirsten Ridley was in court. One legal source said that the paperwork had been filled in wrongly by the serious fraud office, and the prosecutor, James Waddington, did say in court that there had been no legal obligation to attend. This is the fourth rate-rigging prosecution in the UK since it joined a global inquiry which was kick-started by US regulators in 2008. The 11 are former employees of Deutsche Bank, Barclays and Société Générale. None of the banks commenting on the charges. Eurobor rates, like the similar LIBOR benchmark, are compiled from estimates banks give of the cost of borrowing. This latest case focuses on accusations bankers deliberately over or understated this cost to make profit. BGC Partners Mike Ingram says it's likely to fuel banker bashing. There seems to be, uh, whether it's a perception gap, a reality gap or a credibility gap between what um, regulators think they've achieved over the last few years in terms of improving the integrity of the financial system and the people who operate it um, and uh, the public's perception of what has actually been done. Global investigations into interest rate fixing have so far clocked up around $9 billion in regulatory settlements with more than 30 people charged. This latest case will begin its first hearing on Wednesday. Swiss citizens, meanwhile, collect 105,000 signatures, forcing an upcoming vote on whether commercial banks can create money, as opposed to just their national bank. When your bank gives you a loan, they're poof, creating money out of thin air. That's part of the difficult situation that we're in. So Swiss citizens forcing the vote on only their Swiss national bank being able to create money. Lawsuit forces the DEA to destroy millions of Americans' phone calls. David Shom, the father of online anonymity, has a plan to hopefully, maybe, hopefully in the crypto war. State trooper who arrested Sandra Bland indicted on perjury charge. And a woman fitted with a bionic eye. Oh my god! (laughs) Spot on. I got it right! You did it right. Well done. Honest to God, I felt like Christmas Day (laughs) there. And it's stories like that that help you get a little bit of perspective about your own trials and tribulations in your life. Hey, right here in Portland, we're now generating electricity from turbines installed in city water pipes. And fortunately, it's getting the electricity from the funky water going out, not the good water, hopefully, that is coming in. Speaking of water, drought-ravaged Folsom Lake in California rises 28 and a half feet in just one month and a step towards a less plasticky ocean as the sea bin invention floats around and sucks in trash to itself. This is a project that has been fully funded on Indiegogo, and this story was submitted to us on Twitter at WorldChangingMe, and we thank everybody who's given us good news stories via hashtag good news next week because these are the ways that we are winning, and these are the ways that we're going to learn ourselves forward. It can't all be rage against the machine, blah, blah, blah. 
we just remove our consent from a lot of ways. And we'll do it happier and healthier. I thank you so much for listening. This has been Good News Next Week. I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com reminding you, as always, my friends, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. Oh, one last minute. Hashtag Good News Next Week update. Leonardo DiCaprio last night won Best Actor at the Golden Globes for his film The Revenant, and he actually took the opportunity to share his award with indigenous peoples. I want to share this award with all the First Nations people represented in this film and all the indigenous, indigenous communities around the world. It is time that we recognize your history and that we protect your indigenous lands from corporate interests and, and, and people that are out there to exploit them. It is time that we heard your voice and protected this planet for future generations. Thank you very much. There's Leonardo DiCaprio doing the right thing as his acceptance speech thanking the indigenous people. And that's good news next week. Thanks so much.